uh, third delegation. And we have online, we have Andres of Oregon, and he's going to do a presentation on peak oil and rural transition. Welcome to the meeting, Andre. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, so greetings in the love and light of the one infinite creator. I'm Andre Zvorigan, and I attend the Glad Tidings Fellowship in Terra, and I'm doing a presentation on long-term planning and rural uh, transition. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, there. So the uh, provincial policy statement asks for a 25-year plan, and uh, my understanding is that... Uh, Bruce Kenny has a four-year strategic plan, so so I wanted to give a little more uh, context. So we'll be covering global energy context, planning a good future, aligning with policy framework, uh, call to action, and discussion. Next slide, please. So uh, you you've probably heard growth is good, and lots of people want growth to continue. Um, however, the uh, GDP and energy are uh, completely interlinked. And um, energy produces heat, and the amount of heat that can radiate into space is limited. And based on our calculations, if we continue at 2.3% annual growth, uh, the oceans will boil um, within about 300 years. Okay, next slide, please. So the good news is that uh, we don't have unlimited amounts of energy. Um, we uh, have about eight years of global oil reserves remaining. Um, and uh, with, with a range of about 5 to 16, uh, you, you can see, so on the proven and probable, uh, eight, 8 is the kind of expected. And we know that our net energy peaked in about 2015, since uh, food prices have been going up since then. And this is consistent with the, uh, the growth metrics uh, from the limits to growth study uh, back in the uh, uh, 60s and 70s. All right, next slide, please. And so in terms of renewable transition, uh, our mineral supply is limited. Uh, we would need uh, to mine for hundreds or thousands of years in order for one generation of renewables. And renewables are unreliable. They cannot be used to produce new renewables. Um, so for, uh, from an energy return on investment standpoint, uh, biofuel, solar, wind are only really suitable for uh, residential, whereas hydroelectric and nuclear uh, can be used for industrial purposes. And we, um, there's what's called Eroy decline because it's harder to get the oil since we got the easy to get oil earlier. Uh, so the service declines as our Eroy declines and uh, enough to pay truckers, uh, truck drivers and farmers uh, is Eroy 7. Uh, now Europe may be ahead of that um, in terms of that, that they have lots of farmer riots now. Uh, so their, their Eroy may be approaching 7 uh, now. Um, and uh, renewables have an ERO around three, uh, not nearly enough to support an ur large urban populations. Okay, next slide, please. And so uh, th th this has happened many times before. Civilizations uh, have risen and fallen. Uh, for example, the Bronze Age um, in the Mediterranean, it was covered in forests, and so they were in the exploitation phase, which is the uh, lower left-hand corner there. And uh, so, so they were logging it, and then they were using that for industrial production, making bronze. Um, and then they got to the peak, and they were in conservation phase. And now um, there, there are two options from the going conservation phase. The ones that didn't plant trees or future energy sources, uh, they all turned into uh, deserts. As you know, the Middle East now is, is mostly deserts. Uh, but Egypt had a tree planting program. And uh, so they were actually the only survivors of the Bronze Age. And so that's uh, a lesson to us to make sure we have those energy sources. Um, all right, next slide, please. And, and trees and things like that. So what are the most probable future lifestyles that we have? There's the uh, urban salvage economy. So the urban areas, because they're so far away from the food production areas, they will really only be viable uh, as a place of like a a scrap yard uh, to get metals with like a hacksaw and then you take it to the rural areas and um, there you can turn it into farming implements or something useful. Th this is based on the mass dream study that projected 2,500 people to the years 2100 to 2500. And now in the northern parts of the county where it's uh, the, the indigenous uh, hunter-gatherer lifestyle is, is viable, um, though it really that would be more for 
uh, northern Ontario. And then there's food forest communities uh, which have the um, highest levels of subjective well-being and life expectancy. So for instance, the uh, urban and the rustic, their life expectancy is about 50 to 60. Indigenous hunter-gatherers, it's about 70. And uh, food forest communities, it's uh, 80 to 100. All right, uh, next slide, please. And uh, so in order to do the rural transition, I have to have an understanding of carrying capacity. An active 75 kilogram human needs 45 uh, gigajoules of food energy per year. And uh, you also need uh, wood in order for heating and cooking. And so uh, a person has, um, in our area, would need between oh, 1 to 1 1.2 hectares. That's 2.5 to 3 acres per person. Half of that would be dedicated to growing wood, like a short rotation willow coppice you can see in the uh, bottom corner there. And then for the core food, it could be corn, beans, and squash. And then the backup food would be the food forest in case there's droughts or flooding or things like that. Uh, having a wide vi diversity of potential food sources increases uh, adaptive capacity. And you can see food forest production there and a different way of organizing uh, that hectare. Okay. The next slide, please. And so aligning it with the provincial policy statement, so the Ontario PPS has provisions for rural settlement areas called hamlets and villages, and uh, also the biogas facilities or, or uh, where large amounts of methane are produced uh, need a minimum distance, uh, have a minimum dis distance separation formula, 250 meters to a kilometer. A hamlet is equivalent to a rural church of about 60 people. That's optimal for um, economies of scale, uh, which needs 72 hectares, which is a half a kilometer radius and would create a six minute walking community. And a village is equivalent to 360 people, which is uh, like historically how villages are all over the place. It would need 432 hectares or 1.2 kilometer radius. And that gives you that ideal 15 minute walking community. Okay, next slide, please. And so th this is a case study uh, example in the Waterton uh, Basin in here in Great County, uh, Irish Block 24. It's, it's a rural block, um, Irish Block Road and Side Road 24. And you can see there's uh, seven hamlets. Um, so th this is basically where we took the uh, regular house that was there. And then if you just put uh, 15 houses in that same spot, you create a hamlet. And then in the center, you have the village with a biogas facility uh, that will produce the uh, bio CNG that you need for things like bl blacksmithing, uh, glass making, uh, lime making, uh, things that you, you can't uh, we don't have enough wood to do those industrial processes, but using the biogas, we can. Okay, next slide, please. And yeah, and you can see it's 90% agriculture. Now, s uh, solar and wind uh, is best for uh, re residential or hamlets and at human and animal power. And then for village, you can use bio CNG. So that's uh, the human waste, uh, as well as food waste and agricultural waste uh, can be used to produce uh, methane uh, for the bio CNG. And now at a neighborhood level, so this would be like 5,000 people. So you have several villages. Uh, you'd be able to support a FT process facility uh, that would be able to produce biogasoline and biodiesel and uh, NAFTA and, and, you know, the, the other kinds of essential fuels that we need, even though it's on small quantities like 180 liters per ton of wood. Okay, Th uh, and then at the municipal level, uh, you could have thorium uh, nuclear. Okay, next slide. Okay, so alignments with the Bruce County plan. Uh, so it conserves good agricultural land, 98% agricultural, enhances natural environment quality with food forest, cradle to cradle fertilizer, fosters economic prosperity through sustainability with local food, energy, and industry, has decentralized services, and uh, builds resilient communities with that resilient subsidiarity and optimal economies of scale. Okay, next slide. And moving forward together, so uh, we, uh, we could allow uh, sustainable hamlets and villages in Bruce County and consider radio fiber optic and rail county responsibilities, include carrying capacity considerations in the official plan, and can also uh, make a resolution to promote sustainable hamlets and villages in the PPS, such as making a letter to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and AMO. Okay, next slide. And so, uh, so summary, time for a smooth transition is limited. Uh, sustainable hamlets and villages are viable. And I, I know you guys are big on nuclear, and we actually only have uh, 100 uh, years of reserves at current use. If we were to scale it up 
uh, to the amount of energy we use, we wouldn't have enough. Um, well, we'd have 10 years worth. And so we actually have to reduce the amount of uh, nuclear fuel we, we use, and that, that's why I had that uh, thorium molten salt reactors in the municipal scale. Anyways, and so the most viable are the rustic a uh, Amish annual agriculture and food forest communities in Bruce County. And the most important thing is to remember to forgive love and be kind to all beings. And uh, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Questions from council? Anybody? No. Okay, Andre. Thank you um, for your presentation, and uh, you would have heard the the um, presentation before you from Vice President Skognak. And um, the county certainly is. Um, we're all in on nuclear, so uh, we're going to hope that uh, Bruce C pays off and that we become a um, a nuclear powerhouse in in the world. And uh, so that's um, that's our vision. We're all in. On nuclear. Yeah. Yep. Okay, okay. So thank you. All right. All right. Okay. Moving on.